Shalom Aleichem and welcome back everyone. Oh Hashem. We're having the Zchut to together prepare for Shabbat. Parashat Mishpatim. This week is also being Shekalim. As we're entering Chodesh Adar. Be'ezat Hashem. Mishnech Hasadam. Arbim B'Simchov. Okay. Parashat Mishpatim. One of the... One of the ideas in Parshat Mishpatim, we know it's all about the laws, all about the laws that were given in Har Sinai. You know, the the ten commandments were given, but all the laws were also given. That says Ve'elah Mishpatim, and one of the one of the uh, sukim in this week's parasha is a very important idea that we learn from here. We have to really take to heart. We're going to go to Perik Chav Gimel, Perik Chav Gimel, Hasuk. Take a look in here. Perik of Gimel, Pasuk Zayin. What does the Pasuk here say? Midvar Sheker Tirhak. Let's translate those words. Midvar Sheker Tirhak. I once had a uh, chemistry professor in Turo College in Avenue J. And uh, it was Parsha Mishpatim. And he was a, he was a Jewish guy, nice, big time Chacham. And uh, he wanted to give us a Dvar Torah for Parsha Mishpatim. So he wrote these words on the board, Midvar Sheker Tirchak, and then he started to walk way back to the end of the classroom. Because the words mean Midvar Sheker Tirchak, exactly what it means. Distance. From a lie, distance, from a, yourself. distance yourself, from a falsehood, from an untruth, distance yourself very, very far from it. We have to come today to understand why didn't the Torah say, don't lie? Everything else you told me, don't eat non kosher, don't eat this, don't do that. When it comes to lying, it doesn't say don't lie, but rather it says distance yourself extremely far from it. Midvar Sheker Tirchak. I want to start off with an amazing, amazing story that I heard this week. B'Shem the Boston Rebbe. He says that there was a uh, young couple. They got married. And uh, the husband tells the wife, listen, I love you. I trust you. Everything, you know, like a couple supposed to be. But I have one request. I have here in our in our bedroom, right? We have the, the drawers there, the dresser. He says one of these drawers. I mean, I'm I, I'm asking you never to open it. That's my personal drawer, and it's not for you to see. Now, um, no, she's a new wife, a new kala, a new kilin, and she wants to you know, please her husband. Curious, so she says, yes. You yeah. know, it's very curious. She says, like, you can't go in there. He says, I, I share with you everything. Everything and anything. But this small closet, this small drawer, it's just for me. No, they got married. They had kids. The kids got up. The kids grew up. The kids got married. All the kids are out of the house. And one day, this man tells his wife, listen, I'm going on a business trip. I'll be back in about a week, week and a half, going on business. She says, okay. And this is the first time she's home, really, alone, no kids around, nothing, no, 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 nothing to do, really. And, you know, her curiosity gets the better of her. She wants to open that drawer. She comes over and she wants to open it. She says, no, but I promised my husband already 30 years, I never opened it, I'm going to open it today. No, the next day, the next day, and like halfway through, like four or five days in, her chiasid really gets over her and she opens that drawer. And imagine what she finds inside. She opens it and she sees seven eggs and $50,000. Seven eggs, eggs that you keep in the refrigerator and $50,000. So now she's, she's completely like, what's going on? Why does my husband have eggs and money in this top secret drawer of his? Like, what, what's the secret? Okay, he has money, 50000 whatever, but she's thinking, 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 and it's really bothering her. So finally, he comes back. He comes back from the business trip, and she walks over. The first thing, her husband walks in, doesn't even get a chance to put down her, his bags, and she says, I know I promised you that I'm never going to open that drawer, but you were gone. There was no kids, nothing to do. So it got to me, and I opened it. I opened it, but you got to explain to me. What's the eggs doing there? What do you have? Seven eggs. He says, I asked you not to open it. Why did you open it? She says, but I did. Now you have to explain it. So he says, I'll explain it to you. He says, when we got married, my rabbi told me that lies in a marriage is a terrible, terrible thing. And he said, 
This is what you're going to do in order to stop yourself from lying. Every time you lie, you go and you get an egg. And you put it in a closet. And that's going to remind you how many times you lie, you're going to feel bad about it, and you're going to stop lying. And she says, wow, what a tzaddik you are. In the 30 years that we're married, you only lied seven times? You only have seven eggs there? You know how many times I lied to you, she says? Hundreds, if not thousands of times, I said untruths, and I didn't say right, da 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 yeah, Whoa, like and you only seven times lie. <laughs> so then she says, but one second, what is the $50,000 in there doing? He says, well, every time I made a dozen eggs, <laughs> I, I sold it. <laughs> right? the, the idea of the story that the Boston Rebbe says is that that's how much people lie. People lie a lot. People lie left, right, and center, right? The Messiah Yishanim says there are professional liars and then little lesser professional liars and then people who stand lying whenever it benefits them. Like the whole world is like, most people are lying. And I, I don't want to get into the specifics, but look in the world around you. The, the lies are there and you have to accept them, believe them and move on with them, right? And people, you know, they're lying. And, and, and I'm... So what's going on here? He says in the story, the Rebbe wanted him to see lie after lie and you'll see how much it is. But instead, what did he do? He changed it for money and now he made it smaller so that it didn't bother him as much. I tell you, it's interesting. The Gemara Masechet Sota says that before Yemot HaMashiach, in the end of the days, Ha'amet tie nedaret. The emet will be hidden. That means the truth will be missing. It just won't be around. You know, I had someone once come to me and asked me, I'm filling out an application. What should I write for my age? You see, if I write 40, I'm going to get a certain discount. If I write 60, I'm going to get a different discount. I asked the guy, why can't you just write your own age? He said, he said, it never even, it never even dawned upon me to write my own age. I was going to write something that it would work better for me. People stop lying around, you know, it just, just they, here he says, Rav Zef Smith says that he once bought an item and uh, it broke after a couple of months. So he brought it back to the store and he said, listen, because anything can be done. And the store owner said, listen, it had a six month return guarantee, whatever. And it's already 10 months. So you lost your uh, guarantee. You're not going to get your money back. But he says, you know what I can do for you? I can print you a new receipt as if you bought it today and then you can go and send it back. And Rav Zef Smith said, what do you mean? How is that? How is that okay? How is that okay? You know, people, people are just anytime people just there's, there's so much lying going around. People go to an amusement park, right? And, and they're taking the kids, and they have a three year old and a five year old, and then they go in them and tell them you're two and you're two and you're two because if you're under two, two or under, you're going for free. So what do you just do? For what do you lie? For twenty dollars? For forty dollars? Come on, it's not gonna break the bank, right? If it's going to break the bank, you shouldn't be there, right? We should be getting something else for you, right? And, and, and this lies just, just, just come out, right? So says Rav Shalom Shadron. That's why the Pesach says, Midvar Sheker Terchag. Since lies surround us everywhere, the Torah says, you have to keep distancing yourself from it. You have to keep distancing yourself from it. You can't be enough. I'm a little bit away from it. Oh, I didn't. No, there's so much lies. You have to keep running and to keep going away from it. It's a constant battle not to lie. You know, here in, 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 in um, American culture, they, they bring down over here from different sources that they say lying has become an integral part of American culture. A trait of the American character. It's just part of American culture is to lie. It's part of it. Think about it. Uh, Russian culture is similar. Very, it's even more lying. It was, it was a country based on bribes and lies and communism and all that. Re required people to lie and stuff like that. And another answer he brings over here from the Svat Emet. Why he says, He says, you know, every time the Torah says, this is the halacha. And then the rabbis came and said, Okay, because this is the halakha, we're going to make a sayag, we're going to make a fence, so don't do this, right? On Shabbat, for example, you're not allowed to play, uh, you're not allowed to play music instruments. Why? Because it might rip and you might fix it. So you can't clap your hands, you can't do all these things, because you might come to fix the musical instrument. That's a sayag, that's a fence, right? You're not allowed to do something, so they create a fence around it. Says the Svat Emet. 
the Torah itself made a fence for lying. Told you, stay uh, far, far, far away from it. it. The Torah knows how bad lying is, that it made a fence to that lie itself. I want to read to you, Rabbi Tari, from Rav Chaim Vital, the primary student of the Harizal. Listen to what he writes about Emunah. We all know the Gemara says when you get up to Shemayim, we're going to be asked, Nasata v'natata be'emunah? Did you do business with Emuna? Listen to what he writes over here. Says Rav Chaim Vital, Hamidaber shekarim kofer be'elokei ha'emet. Someone who lies, denies Hashem. He says there's no Hashem. Umode be'el aher shehu sheker. And he has a new God, the God's name is lies. That if a person lies, he is believing in Avodah Zarah. Why? Listen to this. Nasata v'natata be'emunah. What does it mean? You did business with emunah. What emunah means? What does emunah usually mean? Faith. Faith. So how does that mean truth over here? Doing business truthfully? Because if you believe that parnasa comes from Hashem, and you know that Rosh Hashanah, your parnasa was already established, then why are you lying? Why are you cheating? Why are you stealing? If you know that the truth is Hashem giving you parnasa, so when asata when atata be'emuna, how could you think anything else? Pay bills. You pay bills, but you think Hashem can't provide? Hashem provides very well. Sometimes you get extra bills because you got extra money illegally, right? So you got it unhalakhically, not halakhically correct money. And now you have to lose them. All sort of medical bills, chas v'shalom, roof collapsed, this came in, that came in. All of a sudden you make less money, you have less issues. Things don't happen as much. A person has to do, nasata v'natata be'emuno, says the Rav Chaim Vital. That means if you chas v'shalom lie, you're throwing away Hashem, and you're accepting an Avodah Zarah called Sheker. What about white line? Um, so the halachic, the halachic allowance for a, lo- a, light, a white lie, a white lie is, uh, you're not really lying, but you're saying something a little bit untruthful. There are some parameters where that's allowed. Um, I'm not going to go into the halachic um, details of it, but some of them are, for example, safety. Okay, if, if in a Nazi walks in and says, where's the Jew? You, know, you don't point to the Jew, right? If someone, you know, the KGB is going after someone, they say, where's the Jew? We want to get him. So at this point for someone, or someone, you see some thug on the street who says to you, um, you know, you're on the train with him and he said, and you say, and he says, which stop you're getting off? Because he wants to come and attack you afterwards. So you can lie to him and tell him the next stop or something like that. Those are called white lies in order for protection. For tzni'ut reasons, right? For a woman's going to, to the mikvah, she doesn't have to tell the whole world. Someone asks where you're going. So she can say something, um, a little bit untruthful to, uh, to, to, for tzni'ut, for safety, uh, these type of things, uh, for shalom bayit. But these things have to be taken very, very carefully, right? The Gemara tells him something like there was a, a rabbi who, who said an untruth for tzni'ut and in a special city where nobody died because everyone, everyone always spoke the truth. And even though he said a white lie that halachically was correct, halachically was allowed, was permissible, Children started to die in that city and they kicked him out of there because they said this city is a special city that no one lies in and you're ruining that specialness for us. So although halakhically the white lie was permissible, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky says if a person has to say a white lie, he has to feel very, very bad about it. You know, Rav Moshe Feinstein, Zechat Tzadik Abraham, you know the communists gave him a lot of trouble. And when he was here in America, one time he gave a drasha and he said, for all the torture and all the punishment and all the harsh things the communists did to me in Belarus, that's where he was, he said, I can forgive them for everything except for one thing, when they made me lie. When they made me lie to protect other Jews, for this, I cannot forgive them. You understand? They tortured him, they punished him, they did all sorts of things to him. But for that, he was ready to forgive. But for uttering a lie, even though halakhically it was allowed, he never ever was able to forgive him for that. Because that's how bad it is. Midvar Sheker Tircha. We'd rather not even to get to the white lie if we can stay away from it. I think for us, we have to do a little bit, before we get to even the trouble with the white lie, I think we have to get away from the American culture and the Russian culture that lying is just so everywhere you go. It's just always there. People embellish stories left and right and just, just lie for lying's sake because they're so used to doing it. And this is the Parsha's coming and telling us. Midvar Sheker. 
Tirchak, stay far away from a lion. You have to be careful. You have to. You can't do switch and bait and other things like that. It has to be done correctly. Um, I want to move on to another lesson from this week's parasha, and we'll start off with a beautiful story. Another beautiful story. Abu Tai. There was once a Jew, a simple Jew, who owned a hotel, an inn, in the olden days. And the way he did his business was, he would have goose, and he would shech the goose, and he was, he, had, he was a shaykh also, you know what a shaykh, and he would serve it to his guests, and if he ever had a question on the kashrut status of the goose, he would take it to the rabbi, he would go on a horse, and travel to the rabbi who lived about an hour away and ask him questions. One day, as he's getting close to dinner, he goes to his yard, he gets a goose, shechts it, and now he has a safek, he doesn't know if it's kosher or not, he looks inside, not sure if it's kosher or not, he needs a rabbi to look at it. So he's running to his horse, he wants to run to the rabbi, and there is a Jew there who sees and says, where are you going? And he says, I'm going to the rabbi to ask him if it's kosher. He says, why, why are you going to the rabbi? He says, what do you mean? You have to go to the rabbi, you don't know? He says, so this man, this guest says, no, you don't have to go to the rabbi. In Parashat Mishpatim, look at what it says. It says, Ubasar basade terefa lo Terefa meat you cannot eat. What do you do with it? La kelev taslichunoto. You throw it to the dog. He says, I heard a trick. If you're not sure if your meat is kosher, you put it in front of the dog. If the dog eats it, then it's not kosher. Because yes. not kosher meat belongs to the dog. Mm. If the dog doesn't eat it, that means it's kosher. You don't have to go to the rabbi. The dog is rabbi. They're a dog. That's the dog. <laughs> okay? The dog so he, says, he says, you're serious? You're real about it? He says, yeah. He says, why? You're going to save me hours. Hours to the rabbi. Hours back. So he takes his whole family, everyone's excited. So they get the dog out. They had the, they had a dog there. They take the dog out. And they go and they put the goose right in front of the dog. The dog looks at it. He sees everybody looking. <laughs> he doesn't touch it. <laughs> well, everyone looking. What's going on here? So everyone says, Simam Tov, Mazal Tov. And now we're going to make now a shashlik from a goose. Everybody's going to enjoy. And they went and they ate it. No. A few weeks later, again, he shakes to the goose. And he doesn't know, kosher, not kosher. He's about to jump on his horse, and he remembers, what do I have to go to the horse, to the rabbi? I have the dog. And he throws it to the dog. This time, the dog doesn't care who's looking, and he eats it. He says, wow, must be not kosher. And so it goes a whole year. Every time he has a question, he puts it in front of the dog, and the dog eats it. After about a year, he decides he's going to go back to his rabbi. He goes back to his rabbi. He says, I have a question here about the goose. The rabbi says, no, I didn't see you in a whole year. What happened? So he says, so the rabbi, he says, I'll tell you the truth. Somebody came to my hotel and he told me there's a way to check. How, what's the way? You put it in front of the dog. The dog eats, it's not, co- it's not kosher. The dog doesn't eat, it's kosher. So he says, the rabbi says, wow, very nice, very nice. So why are you coming back? He says, Rabbi, I have to tell you, this dog is very mahmir. He's very, very strict. Every single goose is not kosher. He eats it all. You know, it's a very, very funny story. But if you think about it, you think about it, a lot of people go this way. They may not use a dog. They do shortcut. I don't know if it's kosher. I'm going to Google it. You know, I'm going to Google it. It looks like this, right? It's kosher. They have some sort of app. They, oh, yeah. Or they come up with some sort of hishbanot, some sort of calculations, and they say something is kosher. What happened to asking the rabbi? Right? What happened? Rabbi Google. Rabbi Google. Bullshit, Rabbi Google. <laughs> Dr. Google, Rabbi Google, Papa Google, Mama Google. Everything is Rabbi Google now. Chat GPT, right? You can even ask him to write you a whole uh, whole essay on why it should be kosher. I will tell you. We know the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot says, Aseh Lechala, make for yourself a rabbi. You have to have a teacher. This week, all these logs Moshe Rabbeinu is putting, like a Shulchan Aruch in front of them, straight so they can understand. You know, we see in this week's parasha what it means to have a rabbi and what it means to be a student. We have Yehoshua. 
Yehoshua, we all know, is the student of Moshe Rabbeinu. Yehoshua also takes over as the next generation leader after Moshe Rabbeinu passes away. In this week's parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu is going up to Shemaim to get the Torah. And it says that Yitro, that, that, that Yehoshua goes with him. This is what it says. V'yam Moshe al-Hahar, v'yachas ha'anan et ha'har, v'yishkon kibod Hashem al-Har Sinai, v'yachisayu ha'anan shishit yamim, v'yikar Moshe b'yom shibi'i, v'yitoch ha'anan. Right? Over here, which passage I'm looking at, so 20, v'yavom Moshe v'yitoch ha'anan, and it says Moshe Rabbeinu goes into the, into the, to, to the, to the, uh, oh. Anan, into the cloud, and he's up in Shemaim getting the Torah. Who is with him here at this time? Vayakom Moshe v'yehoshua. Yehoshua goes with Moshe. But Yehoshua doesn't just go with Moshe to the mountain. Yehoshua stays there all 40 days as Moshe is up in Shemaim. Why, Yehoshua? Why are you staying there? Moshe Rabbeinu went up to Shemaim. You go home. Okay, you escorted him to the mountain. Go home. Why are you staying there now? Chazal says he stayed there all 40 days on the mountain. Remember, that's why he didn't know that they were doing an Eagle Hazov. He doesn't know. Because he's up there. Nobody came to him. No, he's busy. He's waiting for Moshe to come down. Nobody was allowed to go to the mountain. Okay, go back home. Yeshua, go back home. Have your, your alarm clock ready in 40 days. Put on your iPhone. Right? Find 40 days from now. Put your iPhone on. And then the calendar. And it's going to remind you three hours before. It's enough time to go up the mountain. You meet your, you meet Moshe Rabbeinu as he's coming down. Yehoshua, why are you 40 days waiting at the mountain? <laughs> Says the Penina Malat Torah. Perhaps Yehoshua wanted to teach us the following lessons. When you have a Rebbe, you have a Rebbe. How do you act by a Rebbe? Do you act like Yehoshua? You know what it says about Yehoshua? Yehoshua never left the tent of Moshe. Yehoshua was always there. Yehoshua said, if Moshe Rabbeinu comes down and I don't see him right away, I'm going to lose out from Torah. I have to see Moshe Rabbeinu the minute he comes down. And I'm going to stay here and wait for him. I cannot go back. I cannot distance myself from Moshe. Even though Moshe had to go away up to Shemaim, I will stay as close as I can be so I can see him immediately. This is what it means to be a student. This is what it means to be a Yoshua. Yoshua stay there. He wanted to be with Moshe immediately. And in fact, when Moshe Rabbeinu came down, who did he see? And he spoke directly to Yeshua as soon as he came down. You know what's even more interesting? When we have Later on, when we sent the Miraglim, the spies, it lists them in, in an order. And the first one asked, what order is it? What's the basis? Basis of ordering them. And it says that the order is based on age. And the Ramban notes, they listed them in age, and Yehoshua is number five. Not, not in the order of age, but rather in the order of, of greatness. Not in age, but in greatness. Their greatness. Yehoshua was number five in the list. It means Yehoshua was not the greatest Talmud Chacham. There were four other great Talmud Chachamim before Yehoshua. And yet Yehoshua gets to become the next leader. Why? Because he was an actual student. And you know what's the most interesting part of being a student? How long was he a student, Moshe Rabbeinu? How long was Yehoshua a student at this point? How long? How long was he, Moshe Rabbeinu's a student? A little bit more than a year. Because Moshe Rabbeinu was a midget, then he came back and he did a makot. Makot was a year. This is Matan Torah. This is what? A seven weeks after, right? And you have Shavuot. And Yehoshua is waiting. And Yehoshua is considered Moshe Rabbeinu's primary student. And he becomes the one who takes over. Because Yehoshua never left. Yehoshua always wanted to be close to Moshe. You know, we just talked to Rabchaim Vital. We said he was a primary student. Of the Arizal. How long was he a student with the Arizal for? He was a year and a half. 20 months. That's it. And everything that we have about the Arizal's Torah learning. All comes from Chaim Vital. In 20 months you become the primary student? Yes. 
if you are attach yourself to the Rav to such a degree that you can't live without him, you become the primary student. Okay? This is the lesson for us. Our lesson is that we have to have a Rav. We have to have a Rav. We have to have someone we can, we can go and ask to you know, they say, make for yourself a rabbi, not find for yourself a rabbi. They're saying, nimtza a rabbi. Don't find a rabbi. It doesn't say that. It's a rabbi. Why? Because every rabbi you find, you can always find a deficiency with them. Right? He doesn't know this. That one I asked him once, he took him 10 days to respond. He never responded. He always, you can always find something lacking in a rabbi. That's why it doesn't say find a rabbi. It says, make for yourself a rabbi. Even though he may not know everything, you make him your rabbi. Because he will be more objective than you are. You know, everyone is, has his own biases. You're subjective to what's going on in your life. But someone from an outsider, especially someone who's a Tamil Chacham, he's able to help you out. But I want to add one more idea to Zasad al-Kharab. Says on the Mepharshim, Zasad al-Kharab means also, make for yourself a rabbi, but it means make yourself a rabbi. What does that mean? You have to have such a rabbi that can teach you how to be a rabbi. Meaning that what? You see, there's so many times that we don't even know there's a question in Halakha. We don't even know there should be a question in halacha sometimes. We, we, we don't think it's a problem. You have to have a rabbi that can teach you in a way that he makes you more aware of what's going on in halacha. Makes you more aware of what's going on in Torah. Opens your horizons and minds and opens your ideas to life. That's what it means. So it's not enough to listen to the dog, Kasa Shalom, to get your answers. But you got to have a real rabbi to connect to, to be a primary student of, to learn from, to make yourself a greater person. Don't settle for less. Let's move on to our last idea on this week's parasha. Rabutai, this week's parasha, today, during the day, right, tonight's already the 26th of Shvat, but during the day was the 25th of Shvat. There is a great tzaddik whose yard site folds every parasha mishpatim. His yard site is always in parasha mishpatim. It's on the 25th of Shvat. You may have heard of him. If you didn't, I'm not sure which rock you're under. But everyone has heard of him. The great Gadol, the Tzaddik, HaRav Yisrael Salanter. He was the father of the Musar movement. Musar movement is the movement of it's not enough just to know Torah and learn Torah, but to put Torah into practice. Meaning, to refine your ethics. To be the better person. Rabbi Yisrael Salanta Zechatzedik Lebracha was someone who was very, very careful when it came to Ben Adam L'Havero between a person and another person. You see, if you go to the street, you know, the guy on the street, right? You have those uh, guys with the mic that go on the street. And you ask somebody, tell me, what does it mean to be religious? What would be the answers most people would say? It means to serve God. It means to pray. It means to give donations to the synagogue, right? It means to, you know, uh, maybe learn some religious material. But no one's going to say, no one will say, that being religious means being a good neighbor, being a good husband, being a good friend, being a good person. If you ask people on the street what it means to be, what it means a religion, what it means religious, no... It, that's the idea of Parashat Mishpatim. Parashat Mishpatim tells you, if someone hits you, this is how much you pay. If a fire broke out, you pay for this damage. You pay for that damage. What does it do with Torah? What does it do with religion? Tell me how to serve Hashem. You know, tell me maybe I should take on Sukkot, a, you know, take a lulav. Maybe I should take today a, something else. I should take a, some water tree. And, you know, teach me some rituals. But the Torah comes and says, no, that's not Torah. Torah is a man, everything. It's been Adam le Makom, between Hashem and a person, between a person and Hashem. It's been Adam le Havero, between a person and a fellow friend. And then there's a third one. What's the third one? Bin Adam le Atzmo, between a person and himself. How you deal with yourself is also another factor. This is all in this week's parasha. Let's say a few stories in the name of Rishal Salanta and how he dealt with with different people, different things, and different ideas. I have three stories here that I'd like to share. So let's see if we can go through them. The first one is a famous one. Once, Harvey Charles Salante was at someone's house, and he was washing the Tilad Yedayim. 
And the Gemara tells us the Rav Ashi would wash his hands with a lot of water. If you wash with a lot of water, you get a lot of parnasa, a lot of bracha. And if you saw Samantha took the washing cup and filled it up to the minimum of water, and he washed his hands with it. So one of his students said, Rabbi, you know the Gemara that says you have to wash with a lot of water, get a lot of bracha. And the rabbi said, yes, I know the Gemara, but I also know where this water is coming from. You see, there's a poor old lady that works for this family and she has to go out in the freezing cold to, get to the well to get the water. I don't want to become wealthy on the back of this woman having to go out in the freezing cold to get the water. This is a Ben Adam, the Habit old person. Some people don't care. They got to go to Minha, they'll double park. I'll park someone's driveway. I'm doing mitzvah. There's no mitzvah. Ben Adam le Havero, Pasha Mishpatim. You have to look out for somebody else. There's a story here that I think speaks volumes of what Rabbi Saul Salanter was. Rabbi Saul Salanter came back to the city of Salant. It was the time of Tsar Nikolai I. And they had what was known as the Cantonist Decree. The Cantonist Decree was when they would steal Jewish boys, enlist them into the army, and put them into the Russian army for 25 years minimum. Boys who went there never came out Jewish again. It was very hard to. And they came to the city of Salant and they told them that they need to give a certain amount of boys into the army. Otherwise they're going to come and snatch them. And nobody wanted to give up their kids. All of a sudden in Salant, in the city of Salant, a woman, a widow, and her son, an orphan, came and they started collecting tzedakah from door to door. When they ended up on one of the wealthy man's doors, he saw the situation and he kidnapped the son, the boy, in front of his mother and threw the mother out and took the boy, went and got government papers to make believe he's his son's boy and put him in to be enlisted in the army. This woman was going crazy. They stole her son. She went from one rabbi's house to another rabbi's house, one wealthy person's house to another influencer in the community, and nobody helped her. Nobody shook a look, nothing. Rabbi Saul Salanta all of a sudden was making his way through the town. And the woman heard that this gadol came. And she came to him begging him, please help. Rabbi Salah Salanta told her, please come back to me after Shabbat. We'll take care of it. That Shabbat, Rabbi Salah Salanta went to the shul. And they were, they were davening. The whole shul was davening. And all the people who were involved in this plot to kidnap this boy, they got the aliyot of the Torah. They prayed Shaharid, Musab. They were the Hazanim. And they finished everything. They finished the tefillah. And they made Kiddush. And they said they want to go to Rabbi Saul Salanta's apartment. They're going to make Kiddush there. Everyone was invited. All the big wealthy. All the Rabbonim. All the Askanim. All the great people of the city came. Rabbi Saul made Kiddush. And then. He looked around at the table. And looking at the wealthy men and the rabbis in the city. He started to scream. Murderers. Kidnappers, that's what you are. That's what you are. He says, you, he pointing to one of them, he says, you, you're so careful to tie your handkerchief around your neck on Shabbat so that you don't carry on Shabbat. But you have no problems of kidnapping, which is one of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, you don't have a problem with. And he said, you are so careful with mitzvot, you look out to get a beautiful etrog. And taking a Jewish boy and throwing him into the army, you have no problem with? And he went like this through each and every single one of them and showed them the hypocrisy of theirs. And then he says, in this city of murderers and kidnappers, I cannot stay. And he got up on Shabbat and left. The people were shocked beyond belief. And they made, right after Shabbat, they brought that boy back to her, his mother. But it took Rabbi Saul Salanta getting involved. I want to just write, read here what the Penina Malatora, Rav Shainbaum writes. 
he says, regrettably, there still remains a double standard where the high and mighty, the pious and committed movers and shakers of various communities and organizations continue to play the game of who will live, who will go to school, which yeshiva will take them. They think they're playing. They think they know what they're doing. They have no idea. He says over here, you have to really respect every single person. You cannot say, I'm better than them. I'm going to take, you're not going to get. This is Pasha Mishpatim. I want to end up with one last story about Rabbi Shal Salanta and his greatness. Rabbi Shal Salanta was once traveling on train from Kavno to Vilna. And he's on his way to visit his son-in-law, Rabbi Eliyahu Eliezer Gordensky, the Dayan in the city. And as he was traveling in this uh, train compartment, there was a young man in there who was very nervous. They were sitting in the designated smoking car and we saw Salanter took out his cigarette to smoke. Remember at this time they didn't know the dangers of cigarette smoking. Okay? They, yeah, they thought whatever it was, pipe, whatever it was. And this man started to scream, how can you smoke in here? Stop it, throw it out! So Rabbi Shal Salanter quickly took it out, even though it was the designated smoking car. Then, Rabbi Shal Salanter opened the window, it was hot in there, and this man starts to scream, what do you think, it's the summer? Shut the window, what's wrong with you? And throughout the whole ride, every minute Rabbi Shal Salanter did something, this young man was screaming at him. Finally, the trip ends, you know, the train ends, and there's this huge crowd in front of the train station. A lot of yeshiva boys came out. Rishal Salanta is coming to Vilna. So this man, he sees so many boys standing, there's so many people waiting there. So he asks them, what are you guys doing here? They say, Rishal Salanta's on this train. So he says, who's Rishal Salanta? Rishal Salanta starts to walk out, and they point to the man that he was making crazy for the whole ride. <laughs> So he can't believe it. He feels so bad. The whole night he couldn't sleep. The next morning he finds out Rishal Salanter is staying and he came to ask Mechila. And he comes to ask for Mechila and Rishal Salanter says, of course I forgive you, of course I forgive you. But tell me, why did you come to Vilna? The man says, listen, up until now my father-in-law was supporting me and uh, the support time is coming to an end and I have to go to work. I want to become a shohet. I want to become a ritual slaughterer. So I wanted to come to Vilna to get a certificate that I know how to be a shohet. I know the halachot, I know the practice, everything. So I was going to come to speak to the Dayan, which is his, Rabbi, Vilna, Rabbi, Rabbi Yishol Salanter's son-in-law, to get the, the certificate. So he says, you know what Rabbi Yishol says? I'm going to help you get to my son-in-law right away. He gets in touch with the son-in-law and says, my friend is going to come to take the test. The man comes to take the test and he fails miserably. He comes back to Yishol Salanter, this man who made him crazy on the train. He says, I don't know what to do. I can't go back to the town. Everyone's going to laugh at me. My father's not going to support me. What am I going to do? Shah Santa says, no need to worry. He arranges for him to have a habuta. He says, stay here a few weeks. You're going to relearn the halachot and then you'll take the test. So he sends a telegram back to his father. I'm going to stay a few weeks. He stayed a few weeks. He learns halachot. Everything arranged by Rishal Salanta. He then takes the test again and he passes. And Rishal Salanta also writes for him. Rishal Salanta then looks for his... He communicates to people in this man's city to find a job for him and sends him back to a guaranteed job with a certificate that he's a shohet. So the students came to Rishal Salanta and they said, why did you go so far? Why did you go so far? Rishal Salanta said, I really forgive them right away. But in my heart... I still had some anger against him. You know, he really made me crazy on the train for so long. It was a long ride. I had so much anger still. I forgive them, but I was still angry. And the Gemara teaches us that if you hate somebody, how do you come to love him? By doing good things for them. <laughs> so he said, I had that much anger that I kept doing good things for him until I started to love him so much. And that's why I did what I did for him. Says Rav Pam, if only we can look at this way as well. We have people around us we may not like, 
What do we do at that point? You do something good for them. This is the Rabbi Shal Salanter. This is Pasha Mishpatim. This is Ben Adam Lechavero. So Rabbi to quickly review the three lessons that we learned from this week's parasha. Number one, lesson number one, Sheker. You have to distance yourself so far from it and you have to work towards truth. The second lesson was, you need a rabbi. You gotta be a primary student. And that means someone who wants to be connected to his rabbi at all times. You know, so much so, we'll add this on. Brian Gemara tells us stories about students of their, of rabbis who would follow the rabbis into the bathroom to see how they use the bathroom. And that's Torah too, to see how your rabbi uses the bathroom. We, we don't understand this. But that's what it was. Rabbi Kiva did it to his student. His student, Rabbi Kiva did it to him. It's, it's, it's Torah. How you use the bathroom. It's the youth and everything. That's how much you have to be a student. Someone who wants to learn and understand. And a rabbi who can teach him to understand more. And then our third lesson is if we can just emulate maybe just a little bit, if not everything, of Rabbi Shal Salanter, Zechot Zadik Lebracha. And the best way to become Rabbi Shal Salanter is by learning Musar. Right? Someone once came to Rishal Salanta and said to him, I only have five minutes a day to learn. This is, even, this is before iPhones even, right? I only have five minutes to learn. So Rishal Salanta, so he said, what should I learn? Halacha, tomorrow, what should I do? What did Rishal Salanta tell him? Learn Musar. He says, why? Because if you learn Musar, you're going to find out that you have a lot more than five minutes to learn Torah. All right? If you really want to be a good Jew and do the right thing, you'll see how you have a lot more than five minutes to learn Torah. Bezat Hashem, we should be zocher to increase our Torah learning as well. With this, I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. Amen. Thank you.